My dad was Carmen Centrella. He was born in May 1928 in Brockton, Massachusetts. His parents were Dionys and Lena. His family all lived in the same home. Grandmother and grandfather and Uncle Mike on the first floor. Uncle Denny and Aunt Lena on the second, and Aunt Gina and Uncle John on the third floor. They called my dad Sonny, and my grandmother called him that because he was the only son. He was the oldest grandchild in all of the family, and to her, he was his sonny boy. Other relatives would call him Red, because he had red, red hair and freckles. He didn't look like a typical Italian. Sometimes he would get into mischief. My grandmother would try to discipline him. He would run around the dining room table and he would be throwing chairs down so she couldn't get at him. He had a lot of friends, he played a lot of sports. He actually was friendly with Rocky Marciano. They would go to George's Cafe all the time. He really was a great guy. He actually worked in construction. He would always have a job. If one job ended, he would always have a job because he was such a good worker. He was a great father to me. My dad was the best at dads. Carmen and Elvira were born in Avellino, Italy. They migrated to New Jersey. He was studying to be a priest, and when he saw her, she was so beautiful, he decided to forget it. After they had a few kids, they came to Massachusetts. They bought a house on Park Road. It was a two-family that was later converted to a three-family because the, the address is 32 slash 34 Park Road. What happened in the city of Rockton is 90% of the Italians that came into the city moved into the east side, where they went into tenements, where there'd be three families in one apartment. Our great parents thought better, reached higher, and went out of their way and committed to buying something that was upgraded and elevated. They were hard workers. They sacrificed, worked in factories, saved their money, and did everything they could to bring their family into a kind of a life that was elevated. That house was not only a home, but it was a center. There was a giant lot next door and there was a very large garden there. It had all kinds of grapes that they would use to make wine. They not only picked a house, it's a house, but they picked a house that could help them maintain some of their culture. You can see the pictures nowadays of my grandfather's grandmother leaving the garden wearing an apron. That lot represented a little bit of the old world that they Want to give up. I don't think either of them spoke English too well because they were always back and forth in Italian. I'd say it was good hearted arguing. The best memory I have of Grandpa was uh, after every meal. When he finished, he put down his fork and spoon and knife and he'd pat his big belly and he'd say, I eat like a bull. And that signified the meal is officially over. Grandpa would be sitting over in the corner, just quiet half listening, sometimes sleeping. Grandma was a little whirlwind. I don't know how she took care of eight kids, cooked and cleaned, and she did a great job. Grandma's motto was, if there aren't any leftovers, I didn't cook enough. Grandma was into everything, but spoke mostly Italian. The legacy was to teach their children to work hard. Education was very important, and uh, that family was important. Those are the same traits that they passed on to their kids and their kids' kids. They were not afraid to challenge the world, whether they were better or not better. They always strove to be better. My grandfather was Dionys, an American that's like Dennis. He was born in New Jersey. He actually was a boxer under a name of a baseball player because his parents did not want him to box. He told me that when he was a kid, he saw, he was looking out the window and he saw some kids chasing his brother, Mike. And so he went to the back door and he opened the door for him. And Mike ran in, you know, slammed the door and the kids were outside, you know. And Uncle Den pretended he was on their side. He said, you want me to get him? I'll get him for you. You wait right there, I'll bring him out. And they go, yeah, 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 the coke, you wait right here. And he went in the house and he got a bucket of cold water. <laughs> and when they were, and he came out and he doused the kids. He said, get out of here, <laughs> you crazy kid. I think I'm gonna give you my little brother. He would always work on these crafts and things. He would make games for us. And, and he would actually make some beautiful pieces of furniture. 
the work that he did, the intricate work, I don't know how it could be replicated today. So he was very talented. He was a hardworking guy. My grandmother was Lena Centrella. They had a home in Brockton. There's a picture of my grandmother and her siblings. They are all sitting on the stairs of uh, one of their houses, and they all had beautiful fur coats on. The furrier went to their house, made them all coats. Her father and mother owned a store. Oftentimes, her mother didn't know, but her father, rather than give her breakfast, he had let her go into the store and he would make her an ice cream sundae. One day, they were going to sit down for, for dinner in the evening. And everybody showed up, except Matt. So everybody was looking for Matthew. Where the hell is Matthew? They looked everywhere. And finally, somebody said, well, you know, is he in the store? So I don't know. So they went over in the store and they found Matt. He was sitting on the floor in the middle of empty candy wrappers from a five pound box of chocolates. They had a really nice childhood. Anyone that I've talked to in the family, uh, they remember her as a sweet, adorable, pretty lady who wouldn't hurt a flea. They always bring up the cooking though. Aren't you made pizza? Wow, that was a treat. Everybody came up and she had it in, in the pantry too, all laid out. What a great cook and she's always offering you food. She would tell people, don't give anyone the recipe if I give it to you. She wanted to protect her recipe. And not because she was mean, but it was one of the things that made her different. We spent a lot of time with that side of the family. We had a lot of holidays with them. They would come over for dinner. There was always a cookout. She was still on the second floor. And my cousin Jimmy, our cousin Jimmy, was next door, lived right next door, and he was a motorcycle enthusiast. So he was out there cleaning his motorcycle. And after it gets finished, I was downstairs, I don't know, maybe washing my car because I was outside so I could hear everything. And Jimmy got on his motorcycle, even though it was stand still. And he started <laughs> making motorcycle noises like he was riding. And he was really going louder and louder and going through all the gears and everything. Aunt Lena came to the porch and she said, Jimmy, and he didn't hear her for a couple of times, Jimmy. And finally he said, yes, Aunt Lena. She said, are you all right? And he said, yes, Aunt Lena. She said, okay, that's good. <laughs> in other words, she told him to quiet down in a very diplomatic way. And then she went in the house and I was laughing. Because <laughs> she was so kind and considerate. She was my most favorite person probably uh, right up there that I've ever known in my life. She was a sweet, gentle woman. She made life so great. It was nice having her as long as I did. I wish it had been longer. My grandmother was Philomena Di Girolamo Uto. She was born in 1882, as she would say, in Tufo, in the province of Avellino. The family, her distant uncle De Marzo, owned a sulfur mine. Her job was to meet the miners when they came out of the mines with chunks of sulfur and load them into burlap bags and hoist them on her shoulder and carry them across the yard to where the railroad cars were waiting. That was something she did every single day, day after day after day. In 1972, I believe, or 73, I was over in Italy, and I found the village of Tufo, which is this dinky little two-horse town, absolutely empty and abandoned except for a couple of houses that were left standing that were occupied. And I saw the entrance of the mine and this big, expansive, flat part, which is in the middle of the village, and way on the far side were the railroad tracks. And lying next to the railroad tracks were a couple of the old burlap bags. I picked one of them up and it was as tall as I was. And the idea that this woman loaded that with chunks of sulfur and hauled it across that vast expanse and hoisted it up on railroad cars just blew my mind. Her father had come to America uh, to, in theory, make money and send it back home so the whole family would come over. Finally, he came back, and for whatever reason, he said, I'm going to go back. Who wants to come with me? My grandmother was probably the first one in line. She came and, and married Raphael, who was in Brockton. He was not poor. He established a business, bought more real estate. Brockton was a big shoe area, and he actually patented a tool for the shoes. He had a shoe repair shop. At night, apparently, they would go to bed, and Raphael would always smoke a pipe before he went to sleep. One night, Raphael is smoking his pipe, 
And Philomena looks over at him and she says, Rafi, I think you should buy some stock. I said, Raphael, who was a merchant, I had real estate investments. I said, okay, Philomena, what's the stock you think I should buy? And Fanny says, I think you should buy this little company called IBM. IBM. So they bought IBM stock. A few years later, Philomena's lying next to the bed. I said, Rafi, what is the Philomena? I think you should buy some stock. What's the name of the company? I think it's called AT and a T. I know of one piece of property that they used to own that became known as Brockton Beef. And that was a large piece of industrial real estate. They also had a home in Nantasket. One block away from the beautiful White Beach. He died fairly young. He was 60. Raphael was cutting a branch off of a tree. He had a heart attack. My father was out playing with his cousin John. So I know the children didn't know what was going on, but they got whisked away. Consequently, he died later at the Brockton Hospital. They still owned a store, and she had to take over. This woman did all this. There's stories of her lugging refrigerators up and down three flights of stairs. People always talked about her being so smart. She could walk into a store, look up at the shelf, not touch anything, just look at it, look at it, look at it. They come home and make it. Amazing. She lived in a three-room apartment on the second floor that had a bedroom, had a bathroom, had an eat-in kitchen, and had a small living room. And in that space, we packed during holidays anywhere from 40 to 60 people, all of us eating and drinking and playing. So it was quite an amazing place. And she lived in Brockton until, except for the summers when she went to Nantasket Beach, uh, until she came to live with um, my folks in, in, uh, in Cranston. And then when my folks retired to the Cape, then she went with them to the Cape. She was living with my folks, and there had been a whole bunch of research just come out about how eggs cause cholesterol. Grams had made scrambled eggs. I said, you know, the latest research says that, you know, eggs give you cholesterol, and they block up your heart. And she turned around from the stove, looked at me, and said, honey, she said, you eat you onions and you garlic, are you going to be fine? So two years later, the latest research is onions and garlic break down cholesterol. She was not a particularly good cook, but she was adequate. I remember my mother and my grandmother making donuts, and it was really quite a, an operation that was an absolute disaster. There was dough hanging from the doorknobs. I remember that, I remember that wonderfully. Early, up until 1945 or 46, when I was only three or four, we would spend the summer in the basement of the house in Nantasket Beach. That was Fanny, that was my mother, and me. My father was still working in Providence. He would come out on weekends. While my grandmother was there in the summertime with my mother, they would do projects. They, they completely refinished an old Steinway piano they had gotten from somewhere. Then my grandmother would crochet a lot. That was one of the things that, that she did when she wasn't doing something else. She would crochet these little handkerchief boxes, and she would embroider around the edges of them and make a flap top on them. They were just beautiful, they were just gorgeous. My grandmother and I would sit out on the porch in the morning, and we would play this old, old Italian game called scoba, scoop, for hours. And once a week, the ragman would come through. He had a horse-drawn cart and a bucket on the back where you would put all of the rags that you wanted to get rid of, which you would collect. I would always say to Fanny, here comes the ragman, do we have anything for him? No, no, honey, you don't understand. He's not poor, he's a pretty rich. He's a seller that stuff. And he's make a lot of money because he's not pay nothing for it. Well, about a week or two after she told me that, we were in town somewhere, and I spotted the ragman without his cart getting into one of the latest versions of a Cadillac. She gave off this persona of someone who was so intelligent. She was a great lady. There was no other lady in my life like her. She was wise. She was kind. I post a picture of the classic matriarch. She was the only one to keep us all together. Fanny had a great fear of death. My mother says she had a pact with her mother that if it's okay on the other side, Mom, would you send me a sign? Okay. I had just been to California in December 1975, and I brought back some oranges from, from California for her.
and she was not feeling well. And she looked at me across the table as she peeled one of the oranges with a big smile on her face when she saw them. She said, she said Rafi, she said, I'm going to die. And I looked at her, and I knew she wasn't well. And I said, no, Grams, you're going to be all right. You're going to be okay. Well, it was a couple of weeks after that that she died. I remember the day we buried her. It was cold, January day. Well, the cold went right through your bones. We were all standing there watching the gasket sink. And I reached in and I, I grabbed a small spray of roses, which I still have pressed somewhere. About a week later, my father called and said, uh, you know how your mother says that her mother's supposed to send a sign? I said, yeah. Well... Uh, one morning we woke up, and um, it wasn't that cold, but I heard the sound of rushing water coming from somewhere. So I went around the whole house and couldn't find any. Then I went out, outside, and there's a spigot between the two garage doors, wide open, pouring water out of it. He said, I don't know how that happened. Thanks, Grimes. I've always maintained a high interest in things Italian. But that interest was always in a nationality and a cultural way. This is very powerful, albeit somewhat bittersweet. I let many of them slip through my fingers while they were alive, and I regret not knowing them better when I could have.